Right from the beginning of tank development, the idea of multiple turrets for vehicles that could do multiple tasks simultaneously was very popular. Japan, Germany, the USA and Poland all experimented with multi-turreted tanks, but no one experimented as much as the USSR or Great Britain. Welcome to another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host Galahad and today I'll be covering the twin turreted giant that is the SMK. If you like what we do and want to see more, please consider hitting the subscribe button so you don't miss a single video. If you are already subscribed, good, please stay that way. If you would like to contribute more directly, please consider donating to our Patreon or PayPal. It helps us stay afloat. In 1937, Resolution 194SS was passed. This was a general order from Pavlov, head of the Armor and Automobile Management Bureau, or ABTU for short, for a total review of the entirety of Red Army stocks. The Kharkov Locomotive and Tractor Works, or KHPZ-183 for short, was ordered to begin prototyping for a new multi-turreted heavy tank and a new fast convertible tank to replace the BT-7. KHPZ-183 found itself out of its depth developing two new tanks and focused on the BT tank replacements, the eventual A-20 and A-32, which led to the famed T-34. Because KHPZ-183 was preoccupied and therefore unable to design a new heavy tank, the project was handed over to Factory 185. After this, the Kirov Works was also invited to design a new multi-turreted heavy tank for the Red Army. On paper, three factories were now designing a multi-turreted heavy tank. Factory 185, the Kirov Works, and KHPZ-183, who had still not technically pulled out. By May 1939, Factory 185 had drawn up the T-100 heavy tank, and the Kirov Works had named their vehicle the SMK. The SMK was named after Sergei Milonovich Kirov, the chairman of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1934, who was assassinated not too long after. KHPZ-183 hadn't started their heavy tank project yet, and so it became a two-horse race. The SMK was originally designed with the T-35's suspension, but this was deemed inadequate. Testing was then conducted with a T-28 that had its suspension replaced by torsion bars. While not a total success, the potential was not lost on the engineers, and it was decided to include this in the design. The SMK's main turret was mounted on a central pedestal and was equipped with an L11 76.2mm gun. The smaller turrets each had a 45mm model 1934 gun, capable of semi-automatic fire when shooting armor-piercing projectiles. The three guns were accompanied by coaxial 7.62mm DT-29 machine guns, and the main turret had a rear ball mount that was given a 12.7mm DSHK machine gun, because the tank, apparently, didn't have enough guns already. On 9th December 1938, the two prototype designs were presented to the ABTU, along with wooden mock-ups of both vehicles. Both prototypes were approved, but it was requested that the design of both vehicles be changed and the rearmost turret was to be removed from both tanks, reducing the turrets to a poultry 2. The weight saved from dropping a turret allowed the glacis plate to be thickened. The frontal armor was now 70mm or 3 inches thick. The side and rear plates were 60mm or 2.5 inches thick. The floor plate was 30 mm or 1 and a quarter inches thick, and the hull and turret roofs were 20 mm or 3 quarters of an inch thick. The hull no longer extended over the trucks, so a fender was placed along the length of the chassis. The prototype entered the construction stage in spring 1939, but the design team at the Kirov Works wasn't happy with the vehicle. The engineers knew that the tank was too heavy, which limited its combat capability. As a result of its height and weight, the SMK was far too cumbersome to be effective. 
Ultimately, the engineers knew that the multi-turreted tank concept was fundamentally flawed. Therefore, under their own initiative, they began working on a single turreted version of the SMK. The single turreted version had its small turret removed, which meant there was no longer any need for a turret pedestal. The turret ring was now flush with the top of the hull. The new main turret was similar to that of the SMK, but this single turret prototype was given a coaxial 45mm gun, so as not to reduce the firepower compared to the SMK. This prototype was named the KVU-0. The new tank was named after Kliment Voroshilov, who at the time was a prominent figure being one of the five marshals of the Soviet Union. This KV tank was submitted alongside the SMK for trials at Kubinka in the late summer of 1939. The T-100, SMK and KV tanks were all taken to the Kubinka training ground to conduct trials. The SMK had an advantage over the T-100 because it was 3 tons lighter and had better cross-country capabilities, but was itself at a disadvantage of the KV tank. The trials didn't go smoothly for either the SMK or the T-100. The SMK suffered from transmission failures during the trials, which was one of the major issues with the T-35 that was supposed to be addressed by its replacement. It did, however, perform marginally better than the T-100. The vehicle was able to ascend an escarpment of 37 degrees and travel at blistering 35.5 km per hour, or 10 mph. The tank that performed best during these trials was the KV. The weight and length saved by removing the secondary turret proved incredibly advantageous. Additionally, the commander had a much easier time controlling the tank. The KV didn't completely win over the crowd, however. It was working at its absolute limit and the vehicle had serious trouble crossing a moat. The Winter War began on the 30th November 1939, when forces of the USSR began an invasion of Finland. As the war dragged on, it became apparent that the new prototype tanks couldn't be used in actual combat, a literal trial by fire. The three tanks, T-100, SMK and KV, were given to a special experimental tank unit, the 91st Tank Battalion of the 20th Heavy Tank Brigade. This unit, despite being a heavy tank brigade, was primarily made up of T-28 tanks, with 105 of them, though it also had 21 BT-7 tanks and 8 BT-5 tanks. Additionally, 11 BHM-3 experimental flame-throwing tanks were deployed with the unit. The 20th Heavy Tank Brigade was deployed on the Karelian Isthmus, which was the most hotly contested portion of the Soviet Finnish frontline. This piece of land was the main concession requested by the Soviet government, as they felt that the Finnish border was too close to the important port and major industrial hub of Leningrad, now called St. Petersburg. It was on the Karelian Isthmus that the strongest Finnish defenses were organized, which included the famous Mannerheim Line. The Mannerheim Line was a cleverly designed series of limited fortifications that used the harsh terrain of the Isthmus to force Soviet forces to rely on the few poor roads throughout Karelia. Anti-tank and anti-personal traps were interwoven with trenches, pillboxes, small forts and deep ditches. One of these concrete forts was known by the Soviets as Giant, and on the 17th December, the 91st Tank Battalion, along with other battalions of the 20th Tank Brigade, were committed to the attack. Giant was in a stony wooded sector of the front, really rather unsuitable for tank warfare, but the tanks were committed to the assault nonetheless. Contrary to standard practice, the KV was separated from the SMK and T-100 and was assisting a company of T-28 tanks. The T-100 and SMK were ordered to assist the infantry in crossing the stony open ground. This attack did not go according to plan and the T-100 and SMK were forced to call off the attack. There are conflicting reports about whether or not the SMK was hit that first day. One account states that the vehicles were under intense machine gun fire while supporting the attack, but remarkably didn't suffer any hits. 
Finnish machine gunners were very well trained and were likely concentrating their fire on the massed infantry accompanying the SMK. Mechanic AP P. Kunichin, one of the crew of the SMK, recalled The battle was terrible. Our tank, so thick-skinned, was completely impenetrable, but we received a dozen and a half slack hits from the bunker, mostly small-caliber artillery. This combat report suggests that the SMK did in fact see intense action on the first day of fighting, but there was more yet to come. The next day, the 18th December, the SMK, T-100 and KV were involved in even heavier fighting. The three vehicles advanced down a road towards a bunker and were engaged directly with Finnish 37mm Bofors guns. The SMK was hit at least a dozen times by 37mm rounds and successfully engaged Finnish positions, firing its main guns in anger. This, however, didn't last long, as a shot from one of the 37mm guns jumped the main turret of the SMK, causing the crew of the main turret to become preoccupied with fixing it rather than fighting. As the SMK traveled down the road, what the crew thought to be Finnish stores were stacked to one side of the road and the SMK proceeded to roll over this equipment. The boxes and stores were hiding a Finnish anti-tank mine, which detonated and ripped apart the SMK's truck, buckled the chassis and broke the torsion bar suspension. The blast had also damaged the transmission, shut off electricity to the tank and part of the floor plate had been knocked downwards. The driver, I.I. Ignatiev, was knocked unconscious by the blast, but was not seriously wounded. In the T-100, L. Roshchin, a tester from the Kirov plant, recalled that Going to the damaged SMK, our tanks, T-100 and KV, covered him with their armor. The T-100 stood in front and to the right. A KV was also in front, but a little to the left. So a triangular armored fortress was formed from three cars. In this configuration, we not only lasted for several hours, but also tried to put the SMK on the course, connecting the broken tracks. We were well dressed in new coats, felt boots, fur helmets, mittens, and the severe frost was easily tolerated, but the damage was too great. Except for the tracks, the rollers suffered, and the heavy machine couldn't be moved. Attempts were made to recover the SMK, but the track of the T-100 and SMK slipped on the heavy snow, and so the vehicle had to be abandoned. The crew of the SMK were evacuated by the T-100, which had more than enough room to accommodate the now 15-strong group in the tank. The SMK sat where it was lost until February 1940. The Finns had shown little interest in the steel behemoth, though the vehicle was photographed. The T-28, lost near the SMK, was harvested for spares, as the Finns had captured a number of T-28s in working condition, and were in the midst of pressing them into Finnish service. While this was happening, the ABTU was finishing up the job of choosing a successor to the T-35. This honor was bestowed upon the KV tank, which had proved the best of the three vehicles. The designers of the T-100, Factory 185, tried for a while longer to have their design accepted, but to no avail. A second KV prototype was ordered in December, and KV U0 returned to Kirov to have a new, big turret fitted to hold a direct fire 152mm support weapon. As for the SMK prototype, the vehicle was cut up for scrap. Interestingly, the crew who served in the SMK were very fond of the vehicle and spoke warmly of its survivability. The SMK was a vehicle too late to be practical as its replacement was designed in tandem with it. The flaws in multi-turreted tanks had been laid bare for all to see. Despite this, the SMK was actually not terrible, being heavily armed and armored and following strictly the ABTU's specifications. The SMK was the vehicle the Red Army was looking for, but not the one it actually needed. However, the single turreted version of the SMK, the KV, became one of the most important and influential vehicles in the history of armored warfare. This concludes another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. Thank you for watching and please consider subscribing if you haven't already. 
Remember to comment your thoughts on the majestic beast that was the SMK. Keep us in your sights.